Good afternoon, and welcome to the Johns Hopkins 30-minute COVID-19 briefing, where we provide live insights from the experts who lead our work at the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. For the next half hour, we'll focus on what you need to know right now about the COVID-19 pandemic and public health responses. As part of this briefing, we'll have an opportunity for live Q&A with our experts, and we'll be offering these 30-minute briefings regularly on Fridays at 12 p.m. I'm Dr. Lainey Rutko, a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and I'm part of the leadership team for the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. We'll be providing answers in real time today, so please submit your questions in the box at the bottom of your screen. Before I turn to our experts, I want to remind you that the Coronavirus Resource Center recently launched a weekly newsletter. We call it the Week in COVID-19. This is a wonderful way to get the latest analysis from our experts every Monday on topics including vaccines, variants, and the latest COVID data trends. Throughout this briefing, you'll see a banner on your screen that you can click to access the sign up for the newsletter. Today, I'm joined by two guests. First, Dr. Brian Garibaldi, who's the director of the Johns Hopkins Biocontainment Unit and an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Brian will give us an update about the treatment of COVID-19 patients. Next, Dr. Bill Moss is the executive director of the Johns Hopkins International Vaccine Access Center and a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Bill will give an update about COVID-19 vaccines. I'm now going to turn to each of our speakers for a brief overview. Brian, first to you. We continue to hear that COVID hospitalization numbers are declining throughout the United States. How does what you're seeing or maybe not seeing in the hospital influence your thoughts about the pandemic as we head into summer? Well, I'd say that that many of us are are cautiously optimistic that maybe we're through the worst of this. You know, for the first time in over 15 months, we don't have a dedicated you know, specific unit just for COVID patients because our numbers have gone down to the point where we can handle taking care of those patients in, in our, our regular airborne isolation rooms. Uh, so I think that's a really encouraging sign that as people have continued to get vaccinated, uh, we're seeing less infection and we're seeing less people, if they do get infected, come to the hospital. Um, you know, I, I do think it's a little bit early to, to say yet if we're out of the window of a possible blip in infections related to Memorial Day and, and obviously the relaxing restrictions we've seen across the country. Um, you know, I, I think it's till, still too early to, to say yet if we're going to see a, another small increase in cases, particularly in places that have a lower uh, percentage of their population being vaccinated. But I think it's an important to reminder that there still are lar large numbers of people in the United States who are susceptible uh, to COVID-19. Um, we know that unvaccinated people are getting infected at similar rates as they were getting infected back in January at the peak of our winter surge. Um, and I, I think it's really important for people who are not vaccinated yet for whatever reason to recognize that they are still vulnerable, they can still get sick, they can still die from COVID despite the benefits we're seeing in, in the drop in infections across the country. And this is really playing out in some of the um, you know, what we've seen in terms of healthcare disparities. You know, if you look at the, the data from Washington, uh, D.C. right now, about 80% of infections are in African Americans, uh, and they only make up less than you know about 45, 50% of the population. And that's a uh, we've seen that spread uh, widen between who's getting infected. You know, the white population is getting infected only about 10% of the time, and, and they've had a higher uptake of vaccines in that population for a number of different reasons. So I think this is an opportunity for everyone to take a breath to say, hey, we're we're making great progress, but uh, I think we really need to double down on on trying to understand why certain people are not getting vaccinated, making sure that people have access to the right information, access to the vaccines themselves, and, and reminding those who can't get vaccinated for any number of reasons that they're still vulnerable. Um, I think it's it's also important as, as we think about moving forward in, into the summer and activities to, to think about our own behavior, to think about, you know, when we're in indoor spaces, potentially, you know, particularly if there are people who are not yet vaccinated, you know, what is our role in terms of, you know, wearing masks and being responsible with our own behaviors. I think that's that's something that's really been left to the individual now, now, now that a lot of these mask mandates and social distancing mandates are being relaxed. But I would encourage people to continue to think about others uh, in their own behavior as they're enjoying some of the uh, benefits if, if they have been fortunate enough to get vaccinated. Um, on the therapeutics front, you know, we continue uh, to see studies coming out about how we can try to prevent people from getting severe disease. Um, there's a new monoclonal antibody that a preprint just came out this week called 
sotruvimab, uh, which is actually a really interesting uh, monoclonal antibody because it's, it's actually targeted against a conserved epitope in lots of different coronaviruses, not just the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and this was actually discovered uh, based on a, a blood from a SARS survivor back in the early 2000s. Uh, they just released a trial showing that it reduced the progression in people who had uh, PCR positive COVID-19 and reduced their progression to severe disease by about 85%. So yeah, I think we're, we're continuing to learn how we can prevent disease or progression of severe disease in patients. We're still hoping that there might be some outpatient therapies that can really prevent people who do get sick from going into the hospital or if they get exposed from, from becoming uh, um, seriously ill. Um, but I think you know a lot of our efforts and, and hopes appropriately right now are in trying to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible. Thanks so much, Brian. And before I turn to Bill, I wanna remind our audience, please submit questions for Brian or for Bill in the box at the bottom of your screen. Bill, we're now at a moment where vaccine supply appears to be greater than demands in the US, but we're also hearing increasingly distressing stories from different parts of the world that are in really desperate need of vaccines. So what's being done now to ensure success of the global vaccine rollout? Yes, this is so important, Lainey. And, um, you know, many people have commented on the fact that this pandemic has really uncovered inequities. And we're seeing inequities on all different scales uh, with regard to COVID-19 vaccines. I, I think of it, uh, the metaphor I use is of a fractal, which is a surface that looks the same at all, all different scales. And, you know, we see inequities no matter what scale we look at, global, uh, all the way down to, you know, at the county level. Um, and so right now uh, we have hit a, a milestone of more than 2 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines administered globally, but 85% of those vaccines have been in high and upper, high, uh, upper middle income countries with only about 0.3% of doses administered in low income countries and this is this is needs to be a, a priority of the US government and a, and a priority of global uh, leaders uh, and particularly those wealthy those high income countries that have access to vaccines. I'm particularly concerned about countries throughout sub Saharan Africa, um, they are they are further behind uh, than countries on any other continent. And they're beginning to see, uh, unfortunately, an uptick um, and a potential third wave. If we look at cases on the uh, Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center website for South Africa, uh, you can see that uptick um, uh, heralding perhaps a, a third wave. So we really need to move fast globally in getting vaccines in a, and addressing these global inequities. Um, just this week, uh, yesterday, President Biden announced a little more detail uh, on how the U.S. government will distribute 25 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines. This is not a new commitment. This is part of an earlier commitment to donate 80 million doses, um, 60 million doses uh, of which are the AstraZeneca vaccine, which obviously has not uh, yet received an emergency use authorization in the United States. So that's kind of a low hanging fruit, but an additional uh, 20 million doses. Um, and the way these, what we learned yesterday is that three quarters of these doses will go to uh, the COVAX facility, which is the global international effort to uh, ensure uh, global equity in, in vaccine distribution. And the other uh, 6 million, so 19 million will go to COVAX, 6 million uh, the US government uh, will target uh, certain countries, some uh, neighboring countries in, in the Americas, as well as uh, areas that are seeing surges, and importantly, uh, Gaza and the West Bank as well. Um, so uh, the, this is an important uh, step, I think, but uh, people need to understand that this is really a, a, a small donation, I would say. Um, the European uh, Union earlier uh, this week announced a, a donation, or last week announced a donation of 100 million uh, doses. Um, but if we think about it, Lainey, you know, there are 8 billion people in the world. Let's say everyone needs two doses. That's 16 billion doses. 
even if we aim to get um, you know, only 70% of the global population vaccinated, we're still talking about more than 11.2 billion doses. And so, um, yes, it's great that the United States uh, has begun this process of donating uh, vaccines, particularly vaccines that have been authorized for use in the United States, but a lot more needs to be done, including donation, continued donations um, from uh, many countries, but also these uh, contributions to scaling up uh, global vaccine manufacturing. We just don't have the manufacturing capacity right now uh, to supply the world's uh, doses. So here in the United States, we continue to make progress, as Brian said, and that's uh, helping to drive the decrease in cases, hospitalization and deaths, almost 300 million doses administered in the United States. We've reached some landmarks. Three quarters of all adults older than 65 years of age are now fully vaccinated. We've passed that 50% mark, half mark, uh, for adults older than 18, uh, fully vaccinated at 52%. And if we look at uh, even people older than 12 years of age, the eligibility age groups in the United States, we're nearing that halfway mark, 48.8%. Uh, um, so great progress. Uh, we are uh, the the but the pace of vaccination in the United States has decreased. We're averaging about 1 million uh, doses administered per day down from about an average of about 3 million doses per day um, in April. We are on track, assuming uh, the, that we continue this trajectory to uh, reach President Biden's goal of 70% of adults in the United States receiving at least one dose by July 4th. That is an arbitrary, um, you know, benchmark. It doesn't have biological significance, um, but it's an important one. Um, we're right now at 63% of adults uh, in the United States having received at least one dose. But there are, uh, again, gross disparities across states. And there are a number of states, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Wyoming, that haven't even delivered uh, one dose to, to half of their population. Um, and so take Mississippi, for example, 44%. Alabama, 46%. If you look at the really high performing states, Vermont at 82% or Hawaii at 81%. So, um, and people who are interested in, in seeing these data can look at the JHU Coronavirus uh, Resource Center website and see that diversity across the states, those disparities really. Um, just yesterday, the CDC issued a report on patterns in COVID-19 vaccination coverage by social vulnerability and urbanists and this comes back to a point that Brian was making, the real disparities in disease uh, and uh, correlated with that, the real disparities in, uh, in vaccination coverage. Um, so we still see uh, decreased uh, coverage in those areas with increased uh, social vulnerability, especially, especially you know, in areas outside large uh, urban centers and non-metropolitan areas. Um, and uh, this, this low vaccine coverage is also associated with households with uh, children, with single parents, and with persons with disabilities. Um, so what are the strategies to kind of continue to improve vaccine coverage here in the United States? There are efforts to obviously improve access, more mobile clinics. Uh, here in Maryland, uh, there are plans to close some of the mass vaccination sites and really focus on, on targeted immunization strategies, getting the vaccine out to those communities, offering free childcare for uh, families to get the vaccine, tax breaks to employers to allow time off. Um, there's, it was an interesting uh, poll by the Kaiser Family Foundation um, suggesting that a full approval as opposed to the current emergency use authorization by the Food and Drug Administration um, uh, would, would may, may play a role that, that basically about a third of adults who are not yet vaccinated say that they would be more likely to get vaccinated with a full FDA approval. I find this really fascinating, Lainey, you know, it, why that would drive a, a decision. Um, 
you know, and, and it obviously indicates some confidence and, and trust in the FDA, which uh, is a really good thing. But we know so much about these vaccines right now with 300 million doses having been delivered in this country. And I'll just conclude, Lainey, I'm also fascinated by uh, some of the incentives that are being put in place to get people vaccinated, whether that's eligibility in a lottery to win a million dollars or free beer. Um, and I just wonder what that says about uh, the reasons why some Americans are not getting vaccinated um, if these kinds of things are effective. I, I, I'm all for everything that's effective, but it does make me uh, think uh, that perhaps we don't understand all the reasons why people are not being vaccinated. And I also wonder what do people think in other parts of the world, coming back to your original question, where uh, there's such great need for vaccines. Uh, what do these people think about the fact that Americans need to be bribed to get vaccines. Thanks, Bill. Gosh, a lot to think about there. And, and thank you for mentioning the beer and a shot incentive from my, and I believe also your home state of New Jersey. Yes. Before we turn to the questions coming in, I want to remind those who are watching that we recently launched a newsletter called The Week in COVID-19. It's a great way every Monday to get our experts' latest insights on vaccines, variants, and other critical trends. Throughout this briefing, you'll see a banner on your screen that you can click on to access the sign up for the newsletter. And now I'm going to turn to the questions that have been coming in. So my first question, I'm gonna give both of you a, a chance to, to respond. Um, the, the question concerns anecdotes about people experiencing um, serious reactions to the mRNA vaccines, meaning Pfizer and Moderna, including things like uh, worsening of rheumatoid arthritis or um, Meniere's. So the, the question is, what, what do we know? And is anyone um, formally looking into it? Brian, I was hoping you could take it first on the clinical side and what, if anything, you've been seeing. And Bill, you could, you could speak to um, what, we, what we know on the um, surveillance side. Sure. So, you know, there, there's lots of, of different um, potential side effects that we can talk about. You know, I would say by and large that these vaccines are, are really well studied. As Bill said, you know, we've given out, you know, almost 300 million doses. Most of them are the mRNA vaccines. And by and large, we have seen that, that these vaccines are safe. Um, you know, there is a possibility for some patients, you know, since these vaccines are very immunogenic, they do stimulate the immune system to make an antibody response. There is a theoretical risk that, that you could induce a, a more robust immune response in someone who has a predisposition to an autoimmune disorder. Um, but that's not something that we've seen borne out in the data from trials. And it's not something that we've seen in the surveillance that's being done um, for you know, post-vaccine reactions in, with specific reference to those diseases that, that you mentioned. Um, I don't know if Bill, Bill would like to add to that. Yeah, no, I, I agree, Brian. And um, you know, these, these kinds of things are tricky. And uh, you know, uh, after outside of the trial, it can be challenging to attribute a specific uh, adverse event to the vaccine. And there will always be, you know, just by coincidence, coincidence, you know, events that happen after vaccination, particularly when so many people are being vaccinated. And it's really, you know, the job of, of the CDC and the FDA to very carefully monitor and investigate, you know, reports uh, such as this or other reports of adverse events. Um, but it, it it's it's um, you know it often turns out that these are 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 not uh, causally related to the vaccine, but they, it deserves investigation. Thanks, Bill, and thanks, Brian. Bill, question question for you. We seem to be hearing less about the phrase herd immunity, but more focus on this seventy percent. Um, first dose goal. So, so what, if anything, is the relationship between herd immunity and the 70% goal? Yes, that's a great question. And, and I'll, I'll say the 70% goal, um, it, it is an arbitrary number. Uh, it was, you know, somewhat aspirational, but also realistic uh, goal. And I think it, you know, these kinds of goals can be incentives uh, for people. And we're seeing, we're seeing that, we're seeing the states 
uh, uh, you know, trying to get uh, their populations to these levels. Um, but uh, as I alluded to earlier, you know, there's no biological or, or magical threshold um, in terms of vaccination coverage uh, that's just going to shut down uh, transmission. Um, and I, I know there's been a lot of discussion around herd immunity, and it, it's a helpful concept, but it's um, it also has uh, more nuances than I think are typically presented. Um, so, you know, what I often uh, th say is, you know, really our benchmarks are decreasing hospitalizations, decreasing deaths, uh, and continuing to do so. Um, we will continue to have uh, disparities in vaccination coverage. So a national threshold of 70% in, in some ways can, uh, can mask the disparities that I kind of highlighted earlier. So the bottom line is um, that 70% is, was a realistic but asp aspirational goal to try to get us to move forward. And I'm sure after we reach that 70%, we'll set ourselves another goal. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Another question for you. What do we know about, I think it's coming out of Israel, the, the finding in teen boys and um, um, pericarditis or, or myocarditis mm -hmm. after the second dose of, of Pfizer. Can you talk us through what's known so far about that? Yes, I'll say a few words and, you know, maybe Brian will want to weigh in. But, you know, again, this is um, it's it's very important, first of all, that these types of events be identified um, and that they be fully investigated. And, uh, you know, I think we, we still don't know the answer as to whether uh, the, the myocarditis or pericarditis, which basically inflammation of the heart muscle or the or the tissue surrounding the heart. Um, is is causally related to the vaccine. Um, these types of events are uh, are, are rare, um, and so they're not easily identified in the in the clinical trials. Um, and it's important that we have um, what we call post licensure surveillance um, uh, to be able to detect these types of events and then investigate them. And you know, just to give an example, you know, the the severe blood clots were also picked up this way. So I would say right now, uh, my understanding is the jury is still out on whether this uh, these events are causally related to the vaccine. But I think there are uh, enough of them to, to warrant uh, further investigation. And I'll see if Brian has a take on that. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with Bill. You know, this is um, obviously a signal that was picked up um, in Israel where they were, you know, much faster or at, at getting higher percentages of the population vaccinated by and large than any other country. Um, you know, there have been some case reports of myocarditis or pericarditis occurring in uh, young males in the U.S. Uh, in relationship temporarily to the, them getting the vaccine, and, and we're still looking to try to understand if there is a, a causal relationship. I mean, we have had you know close to seven million adolescents between 12 and 17 get vaccinated with a combination, mostly Pfizer, but some Moderna. Um, so the fact that we're picking up on you know seven cases, for example, I think speaks to the power of this surveillance system that's in place. And I think these types of case reports are important because now pediatricians will know and, and physicians will know to be on the lookout for symptoms that could be consistent with this, uh, you know, mostly it's chest discomfort um, and can specifically ask about whether or not someone has been recently vaccinated so that we can actually start to gather more information and understand if there's a true causal link. I, I will say that, you know, my son is, is 13 and, and he got his second dose of Pfizer last night and, and we talked about it. Um, and we both agreed right now that the the benefits when we're still seeing a, a fair number of COVID cases in the U.S. far outweigh the, the small potential risk that there could be an association here. And, and, you know, the cases that have been reported by and large have, it's obviously when we're talking about inflammation of the heart, that can be a scary thing, but most of these cases have been mild. And, you know, pericarditis in particular is something that's very common after viral infections. And, and so I think, um, you know, this, this is something that warrants further investigation, but you know, I got my, my son and I got vaccinated last night, his second dose. And, and I think right now the risks far outweigh the benefits and we just need to learn more. Thanks, Brian. Question, question for you. Um, and this is, this is coming from a, a couple of angles, but for, for folks that have serious concerns about their, their health or being immunocompromised, does it make sense to think about getting two 
vaccines, so not two doses, but getting, say, the full course of Pfizer, but then also getting J&J? So this is a, a really important question for, for those folks, in particular, people who have had solid organ transplants or are on uh, anti-metabolite medicines, either for an autoimmune disease or for their transplant. Uh, people have gotten B-cell depleting therapies. We know that these patients are at risk for not developing an antibody response to the vaccine. So less than half of organ, solid organ transplant recipients, when it's been looked at, have developed an antibody response uh, to an mRNA vaccine in particular. What we don't know yet is we don't know if that will correspond to them, to half of those patients not being protected. We also don't know in the, in the half of patients who did mount an antibody response, we don't know if they're gonna have the same protection as someone who doesn't have an underlying immunodeficiency. Um, so there is interest in studying this, you know, studying to see if, if these patients should get one full series of one vaccine and then maybe switch to a different mechanism vaccine to see if that will induce those antibody responses. We honestly don't know if that's going to work. And, and there's active interest in trying to get those types of studies up and running. Until then, what we've been telling our patients, and which I think is, is important for them to realize, is that they should consider themselves at risk, even if they've gotten the vaccine, even if they've had their antibodies checked and they're positive, I would still say, you know, we don't know what that means for you. And you should still take the same precautions that you've been doing for the last year and a half um, until we get more information and we know how best we can protect you and to make sure that we understand what your level of risk is. Thanks, Brian. Bill, question question for you, and this picks up on something that, that you spoke about earlier in, in your opening remarks. Given the low rates of vaccination in different parts of the world, what are the, the potential implications of that for how things may look in the U.S. and over the course of the next six months or so? Yes, this is this is really important, and you know there are, there are different reasons why the United States needs to play a leading role in the global fight against the pandemic. You know, one is obviously, you know, just uh, goodwill and and humanitarian uh, reasons uh, um, to help people who are suffering in other parts of the world. But there is uh, self interest here, and you know the the simple answer is that as long as this virus continues to to sp uh, spread and be transmitted unchecked, uh, the more opportunities we're giving uh, this virus to, to mutate and evolve and potentially evolve away from uh, the vaccine-induced immunity. Um, so the worst case scenario is that uh, there is a our strain or a variant of concern that, uh, that evolves in another part of the world because of con ongoing uh, transmission that uh, is then imported into the United States and for which uh, our immunity uh, is, is less protective or no longer protective. And we start seeing infections in people who are fully immunized. So this is why it's very important that this really be a global effort um, to combat this pandemic um, so that we really cut off the opportunities, if you will, for this virus to further mutate and and hope, hopefully this won't happen, but mutate uh, away from or escape our, our immunity. Thanks so much, Bill. And given the time, I'm gonna make out the last word for this briefing. So I'd like to thank Brian Garibaldi and Bill Moss for joining me today. Give a big thank you to everyone who joined us and a special thank you to those who submitted questions for our experts to answer. This briefing will be archived and available on coronavirus.jhu.edu. And as a reminder, we'll continue to offer these 30-minute briefings on Fridays at 12 p.m. In each briefing, we'll focus on what you need to know right now about the COVID-19 pandemic, and we'll have live Q&A with our experts. I'll look forward to seeing you at our next 30-minute briefing. And until then, thanks and stay safe.